How many years have you been now back to India? Yeah, come May, I think it would be nearly um, eight years. How's life? Life is fine. Uh, it's good to catch up here in Bhuvaneshwar for Isikon. How, how has practice changed? How has things changed? Yeah, it's a different mindset, different challenges here, different expectations. Yeah, but, but things are going good so far. You practicing in Hyderabad, right? I do practice in Hyderabad. I practice at Apollo um, Jubilee Hills. And the challenges are different? Yeah, people think that uh, practicing in Apollo Jubilee Hills, which is supposed to be the tertiary center of care, you don't come across challenges. People think that people can afford all the money. They can afford all the medications that they deserve to be on. But unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of financial challenges that uh, patients do have. They can't afford a lot of the medications which they really need for their uh, good health. So is the expectations very different of the patient then? Yeah, coming to um, the ICE thing that we dis used to discuss, mm -hmm. ideas, concerns, expectations, definitely the ideas are a lot different. The concerns are also very different. And coming to expectations, of course, the expectations are also very different from what we used to have uh, back home in the mm -hmm. UK. So what's your area of interest? Are you practicing general endocrinology or you've got some you know, specific interest that you are pursuing? Yeah, just like you and just like any other endocrinologist, I do practice uh, the bando stuff such as your diabetes, um, the standard thyroid stuff, uh, the uh, gynae-related endocrinology, the pediatric endocrinology to a certain extent. But um, my subspecialty of interest is thyroid. Ah, interesting. So what kind of, because you know, the education is very different of the patient. Mm -hmm. So in terms from the patient's uh, you know, interest and their, their perspectives, I presume there are a lot of myths about thyroid here. Yeah, there are uh, as many myths and misconceptions about thyroid as there are about diabetes. Uh, I would like to draw this analogy. I think everyone has an opinion about Indian cricket. They also have an opinion about thyroid, unfortunately. People think that they should not eat a um, lot of foods, um, which unfortunately mm. you and I know is mm. not true. Many people think that you should not eat cabbage, cauliflower, soya bean, potato. Some people think that you should just live on uh, breathing air. It's so strange. Uh, so I spend a lot of time educating people in social media, in my OPD, writing a lot of newspaper articles, trying to convince them that they do not necessarily have to follow any of these food restrictions as long as they take the tablets that they're supposed to take for their thyroid problems. Do you find patients actually missing the tablets and then come into the clinic seeing what their thyroid levels are after not taking the tablets? Well, in this respect, I would say that um, the patient population is not any significantly different from that of um, uh, UK. But having said that, we are in the process of doing a study at this moment. We got ethics committee approval as well. And we're doing a study um, in looking into the patient's perceptions about food, about taking medication, about um, weight, because many people who are on thyroid tablets for hypothyroidism assume that all the pounds that are piling up is all due to hypothyroidism, thyroid. despite their hypothyroidism being very well controlled. So these are just some of the examples. So how about you? How is it going on? Are you, where are you practicing at the so moment? I'm practicing in Gohati in Assam. Right. How is it going on there? It's been nice. I think it's been four years. First few years, we're just learning how to crawl in India, I think it's a very different ball game. The people are different, expectations are different, interpretations are different. But yeah, you find your feet after a few years and you're up and running because the science is always there. The human body yeah. still remains the same. Yeah. But as you said, uh, you know, people's outlook towards it is slightly, slightly different. And um, Assam, now it's developing the last few years since our new governments are there in center and state. But uh, I, I'm, you know, it's, it's nice to come back home and make a change. I think that's the important thing of coming back to your local home and bringing back what we've learned. So what sort of stuff do you see? Do you see all sort of general endocrinology or is there any particular area of uh, interest for you? So I do general endocrinology, but uh, one of my special areas of interest is, one is uh, sexual dysfunction in both male and female, uh, which is often ignored and swept under the carpet. And I do a lot of uh, CGMS studies, which I'm quite involved with. Uh, which I presume is now going to replace HB1C very soon in the future. The biggest challenge that I come across uh, when it comes to sexual dysfunction is about breaking that ice, 
like should be the physician or the patient i mean do you come across the same sort of challenges or are they no, I, I i think there are a lot of challenges i think even in our own medical field uh, when i started practicing you know i i have to write endocrinologist and sexologist and i got a lot of uh, backlash from a lot of people a lot of doctors saying don't write this word I mean, they're okay with non-doctors writing it, but they're not okay with doctors. And, and that's often the problem is then patients get swayed and do not get the right treatment. At least we can give them a proper treatment, which a non-doctor can't. But also the challenge is, I think people have forgotten to treat diabetes as a holistic approach. I think we ought to treat the person as a person. We need to give them a quality of life because it's a condition which we can't cure. And we have to give them the best chance and the best outlook with less co with no complications or minimize the complications and yet we should be able to address their sexual dysfunction or sexual function which is a very very important part of life because what i was finding is you know yesteryears people were okay married life not been okay but i now get couples coming and asking for help and they are ready to separate their ways if their sexual life is not satisfied i need to ask you one question mitra mm -hmm. For the sake of audience, for the sake of U.S., how do you differentiate between a sexologist and an endocrinologist? Who is actually a qualified person and what makes him or her a qualified person to deal with <coughs> sexual dysfunction problems in people? Because many people think the word sexology equates to the specialist yes. who can deal with yes. uh, sexual problems. I come across in Hyderabad, many people, uh, for that matter, unqualified people even calling them those quacks calling them those as sexologists people fall prey spend invaluable amount of money and still don't get rid of their problem so how do you tackle this this is a very tricky aspect because we should not step on uh, no, I, others toes as well but it's very important I, I to think educate. it's a very 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 nice question that you've asked I'll bring I'll add another question to this Look, endocrinology as a word is also people are not aware of what an endocrinologist is. People know what a cardiologist is, a neurologist is. And sometimes you have to use the word which is patient friendly. Patient know what a diabetologist is, but as we both of us know, endocrinology is not a common colloquial that they use. And in India, unfortunately, there's not much of training on sexual medicine. I don't think there is any institute or any medical college that actually gives sexual medicine training. I trained in England and I had the fortune of training in Oxford and I went to Amsterdam for a fellowship. So training in India in sexology presently does not exist. There is no degree that is there which is available for you to ascertain that you are a sexual medicine specialist in sexology. There are European degrees, one of them which I have. But in India presently that does not exist. However, we all understand that a common person understands the language of a common person. So you will move both know there are a lot of diabetologists who are practicing who are actually not even know anything what they are doing but you know I think that you need to understand that patients understand that the common term hence if I write the word sexology I know appropriate could be sexual medicine but my patients are not going to understand a I have got a lot of flack from both the fraternity and outside the fraternity of lying of writing the word sexologist but then how would I be able to give a proper treatment to patients unless they know what I'm doing? The way I see it is usually sexual medicine ought to be practiced by people who know what they're doing. For instance, endocrinologists, urologists, psychiatrists, gynecologists. And you can't think of any other, any other speciality, any other yeah, speciality I agree, I agree, I agree. who knows sexual medicine better than these better four, than four specialties because they have the knowledge, they know the means and ways how to tackle with these problems and they're the only ones who can deal with it. Yeah. I think we need to send that message across to the audience that there are only four specialties who can deal with it in a proper scientific manner. The rest can handle it in a generic manner but they don't have the know-how to deal with it in a sophisticated manner. So absolutely right Ravi, I think you nailed it. What I would say is that find out what the credentials are of the patient that of the doctor that you're going to see as a patient and as a doctor if you're going to refer to another doctor what is his credentials what is his experience and take a call on that um, as you these are the four specialties who have 
who have something to do with the sexual side of things, but not all of them may be interested in it. Yeah. So just because you're practicing one of the specialties does not mean that you're going to actually be doing sexual medicine. But I think it's important as a doctor, we know who's doing it so that you can refer the patient rightly and for the patient to find out who's the best person to go to. I think I think on the Taposu note, I think uh, we need to end this yes. and advise our viewers to seek guidance and help from the appropriate specialist for the appropriate problem to get appropriate results. Thank and you very I, much. I would agree with that, Ravi, and I would also say it's a nice initiative of ESI to start this is ESI TV, and I hope it continues uh, for the general public. Thanks. Good luck, everyone. Nice meeting you back. Take care. Bye. Bye.